Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. Uh, I have many favorite things about working here, but one of my most favorites is having the opportunity to invite people I admire, such as Chitra, to Google to share her work. Uh, her stories have a magical way of just immersing you in the content. When you're reading through, you can literally see, feel, and taste the experiences. So thank you for bringing your work back to Google and introducing this book. Her short story collection, Arranged Marriage, won an American Book Award in 1995. And two of her novels, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, The Mistress of Spices and Sister of My Heart, were adapted into movies. Today, she joins us to introduce her new novel, Before We Visit the Goddess, where she'll talk about what makes a woman successful and is this, is this something that changes over time. She's an author, poet, activist, and teacher. And in 2015, she was chosen by the Economic Times as one of the 20 most influential global Indian women. So thank you for joining us today, Chitra. It is absolutely my pleasure, Regina. Thank you for inviting me to speak once again at Authors at Google. So it's always a great pleasure to come to Google. And I have to start off my talk by saying, how much easier Google has made my life as an author. First of all, the search engine. It's truly, I think my books would take twice as long to write if I couldn't research quickly using the search engine. So thanks to everyone who's involved with that. And the second thing is, author, I have to go to many places, often in different cities, and I have to drive to locations that I don't know at all. <laughs> so all the Google map devices, they have changed my life. They have reduced my anxiety level, because I'm, I'm kind of an anxious traveler. But they've, they've really reduced my anxiety level <laughs> and made it possible. So again, thanks to everyone who's involved with that. It is my great pleasure today to uh, come and present to you my newest uh, novel, Before We Visit the Goddess. I'm very excited about this novel because it's about something I've been thinking about for a long time. It is an intergenerational saga. It is the story of a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. So it is about three generations of women's lives that crosses continents. The grandmother, Shabitri, lives all her life in India. She's from the Kolkata area. She's born in a village, but then she lives much of her life in Kolkata. Her daughter, Shabitri, comes to the United States, but under strange and uh, difficult conditions, and can therefore no longer go back to India after that. So she spends her life in America, but she kind of spans the two continents, both geographically and culturally. And then her daughter, Tara, is born in the United States and never goes back to India and never sees her grandmother, not face to face but she will connect to her grandmother in some interesting ways. So this is a novel about uh, what do we pass on to our future generations? And I now have children who are in, uh, two boys who are in their 20s, early 20s. Um, my mother, my own mother has passed away now, but I think of her often. So I'm very interested in that, that kind of river of influence that comes down the generations. And I'm sure all of us who are parents or thinking of being parents or have other people in younger generations, like maybe nephews or nieces, we're all concerned about what we are passing on to them. This becomes especially resonant if we come from another culture and we're living in a different country because we want to make sure we're still passing on important things to them and yet maybe not in exactly the form in which we receive them. We want to make the heritage that we give them appropriate to their environment. So that's a question that all three of these women think about, and in fact, four generations, because Shabitri's mother passes on some important things to her as well. So heritage and mothers and daughters especially are things that I'm thinking about in this book, but also another question that has been important to me for a long time. Now, my own mother, when uh, I was growing up, when I was a teenager, my mother was a single parent. And for a number of years, she struggled to bring up my brothers and myself. And she often told me, 
I want to make sure that when you grow up, you don't have difficulties taking care of the people in your life that are special to you. I want you to be an independent woman. I want you to be a successful woman. And I, I've always thought about that, and I've taken that kind of as my own mantra. But I'm not sure that what she meant as a successful woman is what I mean as a successful woman. So the question the book asks for the characters, as well as for all of the readers, and for myself as author is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a successful woman? Is that something that changes from era to era, from country to country? And even in our lives, when we are younger, does success mean something? When we are older, what does success mean? Is, some, is success something we judge externally? Is, something, is it something we feel deep in our hearts? So these are some of the things that are special in this book. Well, with this book, I wanted to set myself a challenge. With each book, I like setting myself a different challenge. You know, and I, I was talking to some of you in the audience, and you were telling me about different books that you've loved. So with a book like Mistress of Spices, which was made into a movie, I uh, set myself the challenge of writing a magical realist tale, a tale which is set in the real world here in the Bay Area, but has magical elements. So the main character, Tilo, she has the power. She works in an Indian grocery. And if you walked into that grocery, she would have the power to look into your heart and know what it is that you most needed. And she would take a spice and infuse it with special powers and give it to you, sometimes without you knowing it. Okay, So that was one. Then in Palace of Illusions, the challenge was I wanted to take an epic, the Mahabharata in this case, and retell it from a woman's point of view. Because I felt hearing it or seeing it through a woman's eyes would change the tale in interesting ways. So the main speaker over there is uh, Panchali Draupadi, who tells us the story now as she is experiencing it. Okay. In this, I wanted a formal challenge. So this is a, a book that is a novel in stories. I've written stories before, like Arranged Marriage, and I've written novels before. But this one is stories that all join up to create a novel. So this was a different form for me. But I really like this form because it allowed me to move through like three generations of women's lives in a very agile manner. I didn't have to go through everything in every life. I could focus on the important moments, the moments that transformed them, the moments that were emotionally resonant. And I could also uh, tell some of the stories from the point of view of men who are important in their lives. And these are sometimes men and their family, but sometimes they are strangers who come into their lives and become connected to them in unusual ways. So one of the other themes in this book is also the question, what is it that we mean by family? Is it blood family? Yes, of course. But are there other kinds of families? Are there ways in which we connect to people who become extremely important, both positively, sometimes negatively, in our lives? So. That, the, that gives you a little bit of an idea about the book. And I'm going to read a couple of passages to you from different voices. So you get a sense of you know, the characters a little bit. And then I'll be happy to take um, some easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the first passage I'm going to read to you is in Shabitri's voice. Now, Shabitri grew up, grows up in the generation before mine. She's kind of my mother's generation. And at that time, you know, obviously, things are very different for women who want an education. And Chavitri really wants to go to college, but she's from a small village. Her family doesn't have any money. But her mother begs a woman who, has, who, who is well off and who has a home in Kolkata. She says, you know. And that woman says, OK, your daughter can live in my house and go to college. But in that house, Shabitri is not very well treated. Uh, even the servants, or I should say, especially the servants, treat her badly because they're like, you know, she's like a charity case. And why is she getting room and board and she never works like we do? So she's very unhappy. She's very lonely. And she loves the studying part, but the rest of it is very hard. And when she's feeling especially homesick, homesick she goes up to the terrace of 
this building. And she just looks up at the sky and she thinks about her family and you know, she just tries to regroup. And she's always alone in this old terrace in the back part of the house. But one night when she goes up there, she meets a young man there. And that is, uh, he, he, that is Rajiv, who is the son of the house. Okay? He's the only son of the house. So you can imagine there's a lot of pressure on him. And the two of them become friends. And they get to talking about all of the pressures in their lives. And they feel that they can really trust each other with what they say. And they understand each other and they begin to become very close. Okay? So I will read to you a little bit from that segment. Summer had descended upon Kolkata with epic vengeance. Oh, sorry, I'll read you a little bit before then. This is when they're getting to be friends. Days passed. How many? It is hard to keep up such mundanities when one is balanced inside a fairy tale. After some time, he brought up an old red quilt so they could sit in comfort as they spoke. One moonless night, he lay down on it so he could point out the constellations to her. Here is Kalpurush with his shining. Here are the seven wise rishis. She was impressed. She hadn't thought a city boy would know the names of stars. Maybe that was what made her lie down next to him on the worn Malmal though her mother's warnings buzzed in her ears like mosquitoes. She told him her dreams. She would dress in a starched sari and teach history to school children, stories of conquerors and despots. Her students would be obedient. She would never need to cane anyone. She would become a principal with tortoise shell glasses, the entire school standing at attention when she entered the assembly hall. He nodded. She would make a great principal, he said with conviction. He wound a finger softly around a lock of her hair, which he had persuaded her to unbraid. That was what made her fall in love, finally, his belief in her and his gentleness. But even as she confessed her dreams, they were changing. And you might imagine what her dreams are becoming, that you know they're falling in love and maybe something will come out of it. Because at this time, the lady of the house, Lila Mui, has become very fond of her suddenly. Because she's, because Shavit, she's a very good cook. And one day, she made a dessert that all of her guests just loved. And now she has Shabitri making desserts for her all the time. And she's given her gifts. She's given her saris. So Shavitri's like, well, maybe this is going the way I want it to go. But then. Summer had descended upon Kolkata with epic vengeance. Shabitri came back from college bedraggled with sweat, craving a bath, cold water cascading over her body in the maid's bathroom. But a servant was waiting. Lila Moi wanted to see her. Shabitri was surprised. Let me drink some water, she said. Change my sari. The woman scrunched up her face and shook her head. Ranima's waiting. Better come right now. The first thing she saw when she entered the room was the red quilt from the terrace, crumpled on the floor like the pelt of a dead animal. Right, so they've been meeting in secret until now. The blood rushed to her head and then away. They ha she had to hold on to the door frame. When her vision cleared, she looked around for Rajiv, who would defend her. But there was only Lila Mui, and behind her, Paro, her special maid, hands on her hips, swollen with satisfaction. From across the years, Shabitri remembers Lila Mui's contorted mouth, spitting out invectives, conniving slut, harlot's daughter, poisonous snake in my bosom. Her own mouth was frozen, so that when she tried to say she had done nothing wrong, the words would not obey. She learned that Rajiv had been sent away already to his uncle's house in another city. He would continue his studies there. So don't be thinking that you can sink your witch claws into him again. As for Shabitri, she was to leave the house right now. No, Lila Moy didn't care where she went or what happened to her. 
Shabitri stood at the tram stop for a long time in the oppressive dus dusk, carrying her small painted trunk. Finally, she boarded a tram that would take her to the men's college where she went for her math and science classes. She could think of no other place. She opened her handbag, so light, and looked down at the frighteningly few rupee notes in there. Her trunk was light too. Paro had followed her to her room and rummaged through it. Let's see what you're stealing. And taken the silk saris. She'd taken some of Shabitri's own things as well. A buffalo horn comb that her mother had given her. A tiny bottle of rose water Shabitri had saved up for months to buy. Shabitri had been too heartsick to protest. The men's college loomed eerily in the gloom. She slipped through the gate, thankful that the gate man wasn't there to stop her, and ran up the stairs. On the second story, at the end of a corridor, there was a small room with a plaque on it, women's common room. She had gone there once exploring with her friends. It was piled with dusty furniture and smelled of mice droppings, but there was a bolt on the inside and a small toilet. She could stay there for the night. Tomorrow, she couldn't handle the thought of tomorrow yet. When she reached it, the door to the common room was padlocked. The strength went out of her and she slid to the floor, unable to hold in her sobs any longer. Terror and rage, but foremost was the fear of what might happen to her tonight when the night watchman came by. Would he throw her out on the street? Would he do worse? Beneath it all roiled the humiliation. What would her parents, her relatives, her village say if they knew she had been kicked out of the Mithir home like a dog? No one would care that the love she and Rajiv had felt for each other was pure and beautiful. She had been weeping too hard to hear the footsteps. When she felt a hand on her shoulder, she flinched and cried out, throwing up her arms to protect herself. And I'm going to stop this passage here. <laughs> yes, very wickedly, I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to move on to Tara. So we move across two generations and across the world. Tara is living at this time in Houston, Texas, which is where I now live. And now I've lived in Houston long enough that I feel comfortable setting parts of my books in Houston. And Tara has been having an interesting life. Um, she is now, for some important reasons, estranged from her mother and her father. She's kind of cut herself off from the Indian community. She's dropped out of school. She works part time in a thrift shop. And she's just moved in a few months before this with a man she met. And he is a, a massage therapist. OK, so that's her background. I'll give you just a little bit where she's trying to, um, she's trying to figure out why she likes this man so much. Just a tiny bit. I love Robert's hands. I've loved them ever since he ran them over my naked back at our very first meeting. This is not as risque as it sh sounds. I was at body work for the weekday half hour special, which my friend Blanca had bought me as a birthday gift. He gave me a full hour and then invited me to dinner. Over Suvlaki and Uzo, we discovered that we shared a passion for sci-fi movies. A month later, I asked, he asked if I'd move in with him. I knew it was too soon. Plus, I'd never lived with a man. Yes, I said. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. But as I'm sure her mother would have told her if she had asked, there are now problems. And they're fighting. And this is about why they're fighting. Okay. Now. I should preface, I think this is a funny part of the book. So, you know, I'm just telling you because sometimes people feel, you know, literary readings, everyone has to be intellectual and serious, but feel free to laugh. In fact, I'll cue you by raising one. <laughs> All right. The reason for my fight with Robert 
is a stuffed raccoon. He won it from Victor, his best buddy, the result of a pool playing bet involving something called a bank shot with throw, the intricacies of which I failed to grasp. He installed it on our chest of drawers two weeks ago. Apparently, the raccoon is valuable. More important, Victor had shot and stuffed it himself, and he was terribly cut up at having to part with it. He'd offered to buy it back from Robert for $200. And you refused? I eyed the creature with disbelief. Its upper lip was lifted in a snarl, and one front leg was shorter than the other, though that could have been a result of Victor's taxidermy. <laughs> it appeared ready to spring off the chest of drawers and launch itself upon us. Well, naturally, said the love of my life, you should have seen Victor's face. He ran his hand over the raccoon's back. Feel the fur. It's incredible. Soft and bristly at the same time. I declined. <laughs> the only thing I found incredible was that he expected me to sleep in the same room <laughs> with this monstrosity. Want a shower? Robert offered as a peace gift. I considered sulking, but I love showering with Robert his fingers unbuttoning my clothes, letting them drop where they will, the way he holds me as he soaps my back, as though I were a child who might slip and fall. But afterwards, I couldn't sleep. I became aware of a musky odor. The raccoon? Surely it couldn't smell, except of whatever embalmment Victor had used. Was it the scent of another woman? I couldn't stop myself from imagining Robert at work, his hands caressing female curves. What did he say to them? What made him the most popular massage therapist at body work? <laughs> In the morning, I asked Robert to please move the raccoon to the living room. He refused. I claimed he was inconsiderate. He accused me of not caring about what was important to him. I took to covering the raccoon with a pillowcase when Robert was out of the house. He took to checking on it first thing when he returned. <laughs> Without a word, he'd ball up the pillowcase and throw it with vicious accuracy into our dirty laundry basket. I'd rescue it surreptitiously so I could use it again. It was like a vaudeville show, except not funny. <laughs> so. And uh, the thing about this raccoon is when I started writing this story, I had no intentions for a stuffed raccoon to show up and become an important character as this raccoon will be. This raccoon will, you know, um, what shall I say, shape parts of the story. So, but that's what happens sometimes. You know, you have certain plans for your stories and then the stories just begin to grow and the characters begin to do things that you didn't think they would. And that's part of the magic of writing. When that happens, I'm like, wow, you know? Where's all this coming from? <laughs> but thank you so much. And now for those easy questions. <laughs> Praise is also acceptable. What's the story uh, about your sari matching the book cover? Right, as you notice, the sari and the book cover match. And it's a really a very wonderful, serendipitous story. So we moved to Houston about 14 years back. And there's a beautiful Indian temple in Houston, the Meenakshi Temple. And my husband, Murthy, in the audience today, went to the temple. And uh, they had offered some saris to the goddess, and that if you made a donation, you could get one of those saris. So he picked out this sari for me. Must have been at least 12 years back, right? And then I put it in my closet. I wore it a few times. It's special. It comes from the goddess. And then, you know, I forgot about it. And then the publisher decided to create a cover, and they sent me this cover. I had nothing to do with this cover, right? But I liked it. I said, I like this cover. All right, so here's the cover. Here's the sari's in my closet. You know, I'm a little slow sometimes. I don't make the connection. 
but about a week before my tour, I'm looking to my closet, what shall I take, what shall I wear to my readings, and I come across this sari. And it's exactly the same. And this book is titled Before We Visit the Goddess. And that, that story in this book is about Tara going very unwillingly under strange circumstances, but going to the same Minakshi temple that I got this sari from. So it was like you know the universe making a perfect serendipitous cycle. So now this has become my book tour, sorry for this book. <laughs> and I also found out, so the very first time I wore it for book tour, someone came up to me later and said, do you know this has a name, this color? And I said, I only know the English name. It's some kind of blue. It's teal in English. And she said in Indian, in Indian languages, it's called Anandi, which may be a, a name you've heard. And Anandi, Ananda means joy. So I felt this was very joyful, and it was a blessing. That's my sari. That's my sari story. <laughs> you mentioned that the that the story, the the current uh, novel, is about um, exploring female success. And you know, here in Silicon Valley, we're surrounded by Lean In and various philosophies on female success. What's your take? Um, What's my take on female success? That is a very tough question. <laughs> but that's a very good question, because it is something that the women here are asking. And I think, you know, I really think each woman, it's very important for us to create the answer ourselves and not look to other people. I think there are wonderful books out there. There are wonderful role models. But ultimately, we have to decide that for ourselves. So for me, success means that I'm doing something good in the world. I'm changing the world in whatever small way I can for the better and not doing the opposite, right? Not not changing it for the worse. So as a writer, my hope is that my books will go out into the world and do something for increasing understanding between human beings. Sometimes it's people within my community Sometimes it's people of other communities, other backgrounds. Because one of the wonderful things of America uh, is how multicultural we are. And I think it's so important for us to understand each other. And books are a wonderful way to do that. I also think success means that, we, that I live according to my values. If I fall away from my values, I could be so successful in the outside world. But in here, I failed. And I guess those are the two things. And three, number three, I, I, want, you know, I want my children to look back and think, oh, you know, mom was special. I think that would make me feel successful. So uh, congratulations on the book. It's, a, it's an amazing book. I, uh, when I finished it two nights ago, I, my husband was still awake, and I said, I think I read a pretty good book. I don't say that often. I take a few days to tell somebody about a book. Um, and then I'd, somehow my daughter woke up in the middle of the night, and I put her back to bed, came back. My husband was still up. And he's like, you still think it was a good book? And I said, it was a pretty good book. And by the morning, it had become, <laughs> by, by the morning, it had become, it's a great book. <laughs> so um, I reflected a bit on the book. And uh, here was my, well, one of my interpretations of it. And I, I'm curious to know if, if this thought crossed your mind while you were writing. Uh, we haven't changed a lot from our ancestors over the past m many decades. We don't look different. We don't do different things. We're just more dependent on technology. Very minute changes have come into our evolution. So I think the modern day definition of evolution has to do something with a message in your book, which is, um, which I interpret it as, you take your ancestors and your um, elders, you evaluate their life, you reflect on it, and you take their shortcomings and you take their successes. You imbibe their successes, and then you reflect on their shortcomings and become better at that. And if you evaluate your life in terms of, did I become better mm -hmm. uh, in temperament and in spirit than my ancestors, then I have evolved. And that was one lesson that I took from the book where. I think that's great. That's <laughs> wonderful. Yes. I'm, I'm glad it resonated. I think, I think that resonates with what I was trying to do in the book. It comes across crystal clear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. One more comment on your male characters. Um, the female characters are very strong. They've always been in all your books. I enjoy that. Um, but at the end of it, I, I felt like almost every male character in the book was not strong. 
and not in the negative sense, but if I, if I balance it out, I just feel, are they on purpose weak? Or is that a truth that when you have a strong woman in, in the household, it's backed by not so very strong men? I, I, I don't know if that, when you define yeah. your characters, did that cross your mind? No, actually, you know, when I was looking at the men, of course, the bulk of the spotlight is on the women. And that's how it is in most of my stories. I think it's really important for me to place the women in the center of my story. But actually, in this book, I think the men play a very important role. And they are all strong in their own way, differently. Okay, So um, there is Bipin Bihari, who is the manager of the store that Shabitri finally manages to set up. She has a wonderful, very successful sweet shop. But he is kind of you know, the power, the, the wind beneath her wings. And if it wasn't for his loyalty over decades, she couldn't have done it. So yes, he's in a supportive role, but he's very strong in himself. And uh, you know, he has a very special love for her, though she's almost unaware of it. So I think his life is very poignant in that way. So it's a different kind. It's a quiet strength, OK? Shabitri is the one who'll come into the store. She'll bang the pots and pans. She'll say, what are you guys doing? She'll say, I have to create a new suite now. But he's the one who's back there always supporting. So that's the kind of supportive role that some of the men play. And not always supportive. And some of them, you know, uh, there are some betrayal roles that the men take on. But there are also some roles where the men are transformative. In, in the uh, title story, Tara's in a very bad place in her life. And she's going to meet this man just for one day. But there'll be something he'll say, and that's going to change her life. So that's the kind of role that I saw men playing. It's a symbiosis in some ways. It's a symphony of voices. But perhaps a little bit extra love goes to the women. <laughs> Hi there, Ms. Banjuri. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. I've been, I haven't read this book yet, but I've been reading your books for decades. And I remember thank when. Thank you. Yeah, my, um, I grew up in the East Bay. And I remember when my mom first gave me um, the um, Sister of My Heart. And she said, this is a local author. And it got me really interested in uh, different cultures and uh, just it was just a wonderful wonderful book so thank you for being such a wonderful and influence. thank you because that is my hope with my books that they will reach many different kinds of people yeah. and pull them into the world of the book yeah thank so you. thank you um, I have a couple of questions um, I also really love how you have such strong female uh, characters in your books um, so I'm curious to know who are the women in your life um, that inspire you for these characters um, that you draw from? And um, another, maybe this is the easier question. Um, it's so hard not to just want to eat through the entire book so while reading them, because your descriptions of food are so uh, just um, incredible. I'm just craving Indian cuisine the entire time. So um, how, do you, how do you write such amazing things about the food? <laughs> OK. All right, I'll answer the food question first, and then I'll have you repeat the other question. So I'll answer it, because that's a more serious question. Yes, I think all these local Indian restaurants should start giving me like commission. <laughs> So, but you know, food has always been important in my life. Uh, definitely, I mean, I love well-cooked, well-presented, beautiful food because so much of culture is passed on through food. But for me, especially as an immigrant woman, and perhaps for many of you living in a place away from where your original home is, the food that is of our childhood, is of our culture, is something we carry with us. It gives us a lot of comfort. It gives us resonance. It brings memories with us. So food is truly a cultural construct. And especially for immigrants, for us, you know, food was one of the few things we could carry with us, as it were, and bring into our new lives. And so you know, it became a very tactile way of carrying our culture with us, but also of passing it on to the next generation. You know? um, and along with those foods, foods, we pass on certain lessons, some ways of looking at life, some ways of seeing things. So that's why food is really important just um, in the, on the level of ideas in my books. But this book particularly is all around food, because a lot of what the women consider success is built around food. Right, uh, Durga uh, Sweets is 
is the business that Shabitri builds and that helps us become, her, her become successful. It's all around food. And she creates sweets, so it's about creativity as well. Uh, Bela will take a whole different path. She'll be at loggerheads with her mother about what food is really important. But she will, at some point, uh, experiment with fusion cuisine. She'll create a blog. And Tara will have a whole other <laughs> relationship with food. You know, she's not a bad cook, but her, her motto is kind of like mine, which is, you know, from cutting board to dining table, 20 minutes flat. <laughs> And you know, some of this uh, seeps into my life because I have a, on my website, I have a blog where I put up um, uh, food entries, things that I've, uh, mostly things that I've made easy, original Indian recipes that I've made easy, uh, 20 minutes flat, <laughs> that kind of thing. So food has always been important. For me as a reader too, I love reading about food because it involves our senses. And I think whenever we can involve our senses in writing, we pull the readers write in. And I like to do that. And now tell me your second question. Oh, the second question. I'm just curious to know um, where you draw your inspiration from for such strong, strong female characters. characters. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, my own mother had, has been and continues, even though she's not alive. And I'm sure you feel that if any of your parents or grandparents have passed away, the influence continues, right? So she's been an inspiration. I was very blessed when I went to college in Kolkata that I volunteered with Mother Teresa. And she was a true inspiration for me. And she was so giving. She was so loving. She did very quietly so much for people around her. So she was an inspiration. But actually, my characters come from the imagination. And I have to do this. I have to imagine my characters. Uh, maybe I'll take just a little kernel from real life. But I really have to go into the imaginary realm. Otherwise, I don't have the freedom to make them do what they need to do. Sometimes, you know, bad things, bad decisions. <laughs> However, this is just a secret between you and me. I never tell my family and friends this. Instead, I tell them, you better be good to me or else. <laughs> yeah, or else. <laughs> so I wore teal today entirely on purpose, as you can see. Um, there are a few questions on the dory. Whoever is running them, you could probably check there as well. And since I'm here in person, I'd ask my question directly. Um, there's a lot of talk about unconscious bias, right? And um, I wanted to ask you, what should um, you know straight men like myself do in order to make sure we don't introduce unconscious bias and uh, become roadblocks in the success of women or even people who identify themselves with other gender identities? What would your advice be for um, okay. men in general, I guess? Yeah, so unconscious bias is, um, so full disclosure, uh, I'm a big fan of Sheryl Sandberg as well, um, my ex-employer and whatnot. So she, um, she talks about an example where in a conference room, if a woman speaks up and gives an idea, right, um, it just passes over. Five minutes later, a man picks up the exact same idea, says the exact same words, and oh, that makes a lot of sense now. So this is an unconscious bias. Often we are not even aware that we are doing it, but it just sneaks in. That's why even in Google screening interviews right now, the names are hidden. We always refer to people as the candidate, and we don't say him or her, stuff like that. Very interesting. So Very interesting. What, is, what would be your take on the whole thing? I guess, okay. or the advice for yes. people like me. I, I think, you know, that's a, great, that's a great question. It's a complex question. I'm not sure I have, you know, a, the definitive answer. But I think for, and I, I've been at the receiving end of that. I mean, in, uh, you know, in meetings, exactly the same thing has happened to me. So I'm very aware of that. I think, you know, um, the first thing is to become aware of it and certainly like what you're doing, becoming aware of it is step one, right? I think along with becoming aware of it, when you see others who are not aware of it, we have to be able to speak up, not in kind of some kind of confrontational way, but just pointing out, look, you know, look, this is what you just did, this is what you just said. So I think a lot of times, I mean, unless it's proved otherwise, I always start from the point or from the premise that this person doesn't necessarily intend ill, but is just not aware of what's going on, or it's been conditioned so into 
him or sometimes her. I mean, women do this as well. So that they're not aware of what they're doing or what they're saying or how they're putting someone down. So I think the first thing is to make people aware of that. And that is, that's like the Band-Aid, right? But I think you know, one of the things that's really important to me is to start with younger people, with children, because their minds haven't become closed in that kind of way. So if we start with children, introducing them to positive ideas about women or about people who are maybe not straight, you know, they, they're gay, gay people or whatever, wherever the pride prejudices are, people of another community, communities of color. We have, we're, you know, we put stereotypes into the heads of children. They don't come with any of that. So instead, if we can start putting positive things, and a great thing to do is to introduce them to all these ideas through literature. Because, you know, literature is a wonderful and non-threatening and inviting way of bringing people into worlds and experiences they don't know. And that begins to change people's minds. And so I think, uh, you know, reading multicultural books with children is very important. Discussing these issues with them is very important. And in the adult world, speaking up against it uh, when we see prejudice of this kind is very important. I always try uh, to put some of those ideas into my books. One of the reasons I want to show strong women, not perfect women, right? Women who are just human. They have positives and negatives, but they're strong. And I want people to understand where they're coming from. I want people to be compassionate towards their problems. And I, my hope is that as people read these books, their minds will begin to change in some ways. And therefore, I'm really pleased to see the men in the audience because you know, a, a lot of women will naturally gravitate to the thinking. But it's always very special for me when men read the books and they say, oh, you know, I really related to that woman character. I can understand her. Empathy is at the heart of human experience. Empathy is at the heart of human success. If we can't be empathetic, Everything else we do, you know, it just falls by the roadside. So that's a great question. There's a question on the Dory that um, I want to bring to attention, and yours is long, Dory, so you've already answered that. Um, but one of them is, how did you get started as an author, and what motivates you to keep writing? How did I get started as an author, and what motivates me to keep writing? Now, you know, I, I kind of fell into writing in a strange manner. When I was growing up in India, I never thought I would become a writer and really didn't write anything. I never thought I had a story worth telling that people would be interested in. Because I was so immersed in my culture, I felt everyone's life is just like mine. So it was years after I came to the US that I became a writer. And I really think immigration made me into a writer for two reasons. The one thing is when I was in my home culture, I didn't think about it. It was just there. It was when I came to America, I began to see my Indian culture, really, um, for what it was. And I began to see what I appreciated and missed about it. And I began to have some questions about things like women's roles and so forth in Indian culture. So, and, and it wasn't around me. I missed it. So I wanted to write about it, to recreate it through books, stories at that time. I didn't know that. I was going to be any good or if I was going to publish anything. I just wrote to understand for myself. I think that's really important. And I wrote to understand not just India, but what I was seeing around me, other immigrants like myself. And immigration was such an amazing experience. It was at once transformative and terrifying because it was the first time I was living on my own away from my family. I was living in a culture where all the rules seemed different. So you know, I wanted to figure things out through writing. And I could see other people around me were going through the same kind of experience. So that's how I became a writer, very tentatively. For years, I was a closet writer. Nobody knew I was writing. I would be teaching during the day. Late at night, I would sit at my desk and write. And just, uh, I should share this. Uh, don't tell other people. <laughs> when I started, <laughs> when I started, I was really bad. I wasn't good. I was really bad. 
but I got better. And that's the amazing thing about writing, is if you, and any art, I think, if you are sincerely dedicated to it and you keep writing and you listen, you know, you get good feedback from people and you listen and you try to get better, you do. That was certainly the case. With My question is related to how we define success and especially uh, for women. And um, I'm an immigrant like you, and I grew up, and my mom didn't get to go to college, so, and we, had, we were three daughters, and she said, I want you guys all to go to college. So my image of who I would be was always about having a career. So I got engineering, I came to America, have got married, and somewhere along I became a mother too. And to me, and at some point in my life I had to decide to quit work, so then it was the hardest decision for me because whatever image I had of me as defined as success, did not involve staying home and raising kids. Because that's what my grandmother did. Mm -hmm. Somehow I, I had this message given to me, not through words, all that my mom said was, I want you to have education, I want you to be independent, whatever. But mm -hmm. somehow I translated it to not being a home, being a homemaker meant it was not success. But somehow I did, ma I did stay home, raise my kids, and now I'm back at Google. So, and I have a daughter who's 22 years old now, and so I'm, I've been telling a lot of things the same way my mom told me. Yeah. And there will be times in her life she'll be making decisions. Yes. Which, it's not the exact words I said to her, but how she understood it. And so, and not only that, in my own life, as you said, like the definition of success has changed. Yeah. And we take on different roles, and different roles need different levels of um, uh, contribution and the su success definition changes and, and we add from, we get messages from the media and the peer group and everything else in addition to what you heard from home. Yes. So, and I agree with your principles about being true to yourself and sometimes what you heard growing up and thinking what is success could be in contradiction with what you feel as your own value system. Yes. And then the conflict and so I just want you to shed some light because this topic is interesting to me. Yes, that's a great topic. And you know, it's not like I have all the answers here, folks. I just, you know, I just write books in which people are always messing up their lives. So. But I think, you know, we just do the best with the intentions that we have at that point, with the information we have at that point, and with the amount of maturity we have at that point. And so one of the lessons that the women in Before We Visit the Goddess they have to learn, and it's a lesson I think I have to learn, and I hope I'm learning, is just as we forgive other people, we have to forgive ourselves. We have to forgive our ancestors. They passed on the best message they knew how to pass on, right? And we received it the best way we knew how to receive it. The intention was always good. The intention was never bad. The intention was loving. And so we did the best we could. And if it didn't, if it wasn't, now I look back, and believe me, I look back on some of my earlier decisions, and I'm like, oh. But you know, I have compassion for the person I was at that point. That person did the best she could. So you know, I think it's, it's important to find a balance. We want to be thinking individuals, but we don't want to dwell too much upon things that we are doing, because we're always making mistakes. Fortunately, fortunately, I think our children are smarter than we give them credit for, and they will turn out just fine. In spite of all the mistakes I made in parenting, I, th I, I have hope that my children will turn out just fine. <laughs> The reason I asked you about unconscious bias was I think I've been subject to unconscious bias, but I've also been the one who caused unconscious yes. bias. And I'm going to share a story, and then very quickly, because I want to take away from you, but does, I think I'd be, we'd be lying if we think we're the only ones who are subject to it. So uh, I've, uh, I've had a boss here at Google. She, took, she was there, took Google public. She's left Google since then, takes all companies public. I met her for dinner once, and she, I said, oh, yeah, how's Lauren doing? She's said, yeah, her second birthday is coming up, but you know, I have no idea. David's organizing the birthday parties. I don't even know anything about princesses. In my mind, I did say, really, Mona? Like, you have no idea about your daughter's second birthday and your husband's ring. And I walked away thinking, I'm, I'm all about women empowerment. I teach the stretch classes here. I counsel a lot of women outside Google. And I was thinking, this is me, the thing I'm fighting against. So a lot of times when we talk about unconscious bias, and that's why I asked you that question, is we're doing a lot of the to ourselves and to yes. the women around us. 
So just yes. I'll share that because if it, the whole thing about intention and being aware of what things yes. we're doing, so we're fighting against ourselves. <laughs> yes, I think that's so important. But just the fact that you became aware of that, that's a huge growth step. That's a huge growth step. And you know, that's why we have a prayer in our language in, in, in Sanskrit that I say often, and I say, oh Lord, Forgive me for the things, bad things I've done, some of which I've known, and a lot of which I don't even know that I did it. So just please help me become a better person. Because we don't become aware of it. Becoming aware is the first and perhaps the most important step towards change. So I commend you for sharing that story. The thread that I'm noticing all the way through, through our discussion and your responses is that compassion is it's, it's the kernel to every woman's success. And in addition to that, your compassion for yourself, compassion to not begrudge yourself, because often, you know, the definition, the male definition of success is very different. It, it doesn't require, you know, if you, if you need to balance being a mother versus being a father necessarily, there are different sacrifices with being a mother. You know, your body's taken over for 10 months, there's certain things that are in inevitable. Yes, that, and the body continues like many yeah, months Yeah, it's after. all downhill after that in yes. many ways, but yes. also very uphill in other ways. But uh, um, it strikes me that female compassion is, it's not, it's possible only when you have compassion towards yourself, but also only when you have a compassionate partner that enables you and encourages you. And yes. that's, you know, that's something common also to, you know, more w Western or less, you know, more Western ideas of what female success is too. You know, Sheryl Sandberg also says that, you know, you right. pick a partner who lets you lean in or helps you lean in. Right, um, right. Yeah. Right. And to that, I, I think those are very good uh, ideas and very important points. And to that, I will say that is the ideal situation. And then I'll say, you know, a lot of times the situation isn't ideal. What are we going to do? We're going to do the best we can. But if I don't have such a partner, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to do the best I can. I mean, I'm blessed. I do have a partner like that who's very supportive. But if I didn't, I shouldn't make myself stop short. I shouldn't short my, change myself because the people around me are not going to support me. I'm going to say, you know, Tagore has this wonderful song, Akla Chaluri. It means walk by yourself, forward by yourself. Hopefully people will be there to help, but ultimately it's me. It's your journey. It's my journey. And I, I really can't blame other people for whatever happens. I understand, yes. Some people help, some people don't. But ultimately, I believe it's my journey. And it's not even how much I achieve outside, but it's my journey in terms of my attitude inside. right? Nobody else affects my attitude. Now, I read this sometimes back, and it's really stuck with me. We sometimes say, so-and-so made me unhappy, so-and-so made me unsuccessful, so-and-so did. No, no, no. I'm the one who makes myself unhappy. And any time I think otherwise, I'm thinking wrongly. I'm just passing the buck, right? So, and I think that's the greatest success, right? right? Realizing that I'm the one who makes it happen. That's success. And that, there's a moment when Shabitri realizes that in her life. She's thinking about what is the happiest moment in her life, and I won't give it away. But it's a moment that deals with herself, not with the people around her. In fact, as long as Shabitri is waiting for happiness to happen because of some external relationship, it slips away from her, right? And I think it slips away from all of us, too. Thanks. Thank you.